Hello, and welcome back to Maturing the Bride. We are in book number five. We are looking at the difference between grace versus works because the Bible's full of grace and the Bible's full of works. We looked at the first chapter. We talked about our inheritance, and we found out that our inheritance are our rewards. And we learned that there was a huge difference between having our names recorded in heaven and being rewarded in heaven. In chapter 2, we asked the question, can Christians lose their inheritance? Can they lose their rewards? And we found out absolutely yes. We can make it to heaven and lose our inheritance. We then went on to chapter 3. And we asked, are rewards central in the teachings of Jesus? We looked at his greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, and we found out that Jesus never called us simply to be children of God. He called us to be workers, disciples, and friends, those who obey him. Then we went to chapter 4, and we discovered that there are two key reasons why Christ came to the earth. The first one most of us are familiar with, he came to glorify God by restoring all things. But the second reason, few have heard, and that is to demonstrate that a life lived well gets rewarded well. We then went on to chapter number five. How different will our rewards be? We found out not everyone is going to be the same in heaven. We're not all the same holding hands, singing Kumbaya. There will be major differences. We then went on to chapter six. We found out that what we do today determines our forever. Our rewards far outweigh our works. And the question is, are we going to get a shack or are we going to get a mansion for all of eternity? Your day-to-day -day choices will affect your eternity. It's that simple. We now get to chapter 7. Why you want to finish strong. That's the purpose of this lecture. Men and women, I'm here to tell you there are special rewards for those who finish strong. Years ago, I heard a story about two men, one man named Thomas, one man named Jack. Eventually, they died on the same day, and they went to heaven together. And when they went to heaven, they eventually learned their rewards. Thomas, in his young state, got a mansion. It was huge. It was beautiful. He loved it. And together they went to Jack's mansion. And when they got to Jack's, they said, uh, hey, Jesus, <laughs> why did Thomas get a mansion and I get a shack? And Jesus said, dude, I used every scrap of lumber you sent me. <laughs> In other words, our works are the lumber that help build the mansion. Men and women, I want to challenge you that many Christians have been misled. They've been misled that Jesus' blood shed on the cross gets them rewards. Jesus' blood gets me rewards. Men and women, that is not biblical. That is not true. That is not accurate. I have scoured the Word of God. I have gone through it again and again. I've looked at every reference to the death of Jesus and to his blood, and nowhere, nowhere, does it say that Jesus' blood gives us rewards? Let's just go over a few samples. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Nothing about rewards there, just redemption. Our sins are forgiven. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He died for our sins. Nothing about rewards there. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Redeemed from the empty way of life. Nothing there about rewards. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. To bring you to God. But nothing about rewards. Men and women, it's not there. Christ's death brought us to God, but gives us zero rewards. 
zero rewards. To graphically show this to you, the blood of Jesus takes us out of hell into heaven, but it gives us zero rewards. Men and women, good works earn us the rewards, and I'm here to tell you that there are special rewards for those who finish strong. Finishing strong in the Greek in the New Testament is used as the word the one who conquers or the one who is victorious. Depending upon your version, it'll say conquers or victorious. The Greek word is nikeo. It's where we got the word Nike from. The man who made up his shoe company got it from this Greek word. It means to carry off the victory, to come off victorious. The man who made his shoe company wanted his athletes to feel victorious, to finish strong. And that's exactly what Paul writes about and Jesus writes about and God spoke through the Apostle John in writing the book of Revelation about the seven churches. In every one of the seven churches there are special rewards for those who finish strong. Special rewards for the victorious. So we're going to go over all of the seven churches. Each church and we're going to see what did they get? What was the special reward? Let's start with church number one, the church at Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, To him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works. Okay, oh, whoa, whoa, stop right there. Hold the phone. I know your works? Why wouldn't he say, I know your faith? Oh, he knows they're believers. He's not worried about their faith. He wants to see how they did in their works. Men and women, we've said it before. I'll say it again. I'll repeat it as many times as I need to. We are not entitled to rule and reign. We're not entitled to go to the top of the company. We're not entitled to be in the throne of Christ, to sit with him on his throne. That is not an entitlement. Grace is what gets us into heaven, but works earn us the right to rule and reign. Again, grace gets us into heaven, but our rewards are based on good works. So in every church, he says, I know your works. He doesn't say, I know your faith. He knows they're believers. He's saying, I want to see how you did with your works. I want to see if you're going to get the right to rule and reign. These seven churches are being analyzed. Are you going to rule and reign? And that's what he's saying to us today. I want to know, I know you're my child, but I want to know if you've been faithful. I want to hold you accountable. Just like Luke chapter 19, the man went away to receive a kingdom and he came back and to see how his stewards had done, to see how his servants had done. So this is about works. In verse 7, to the one who conquers, oh, now he's getting to the one who finishes strong in the church, Smyrna. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. There are two key points in here. The first point is eat, to eat. Men and women, that is a Semitic, a Mediterranean, an Old Testament way of saying close fellowship. Eating a meal means close fellowship. And so what he's saying, the one who conquers, you're going to have closer fellowship, closer fellowship with God. And then it says, you get to eat from the tree of life, the tree of life. You have to conquer to eat of the tree of life. Now, we want to think this is about eternal life, but that doesn't fit with the rest of the scriptures. Why? In Genesis 3, verse 22, it sounds like it. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat, he will live forever. We think, well, he's talking about eternal destiny. No, it doesn't really fit the text. He already ate. And as he already ate, Adam and Eve, God said, if you eat the fruit, you're going to die. They've already died. They've got a spiritual separation. They're going to be separated from God. They've got relationship, but they're separated in fellowship. This eating of the tree of life is a permanency to that. And he didn't want that. It had nothing to do with salvation. It was a permanent state. And also in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, to the one who conquers, I'll grant to eat from the tree of life. You've got to conquer. Again, conquering is works oriented. If it meant eternal life, it means you've got to finish strong in order to get to heaven. But that doesn't fit Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for we're saved by grace, not by works, nor does it fit Revelation 21, 6. 
And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Without payment. Same thing. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not as a result of works. So this tree of life is not talking about eternal salvation. It's talking about something different. And there are four other references to the tree of life in the book of Proverbs. Let's discover what those are. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 18. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. It's in the context of wisdom. She, the tree of life, is wisdom. Proverbs 11.30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. Fruit works. Huh. Okay, the tree of life is the fruit. It's the result of works. Proverbs 13.12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. A desire fulfilled, that's joy, that's happiness. Yeah, that's what he's talking about. The tree of life here is joy and happiness. Proverbs 15, verse 4. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A gentle tongue is a tree of life. Gentle tongue versus a perverseness that breaks the spirit. He's talking about peace and contentment. So, let's go back. Revelation 2, 7. The one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. What's he saying? He's saying you're going to have closer fellowship and a much better quality of life, a higher quality of life. So the one who conquers, closer fellowship with God and Jesus, and a higher quality of life. Quality of life, quality of life. Where have we, how could that fit into what we've already learned? Oh, yeah, purses that do not wear out. Oh, a small foundation or a large foundation to build upon. Oh, quality of life. All right, let's look at the second church, Smyrna. Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. And the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Will not be hurt by the second death. Oh, that means you're not going to go to hell. You get to go to heaven, right? Wrong. This is an ironic understatement. It's an understatement. It's uh, what uh, is called uh, litotes or latitis, if you pronounce it correctly. I don't even know if that's correct. It's an understatement. Let me give you an example of an understatement. Someone says, hey, you won't be sorry. They're saying you're going to be very happy. <laughs> it's an understatement. You won't be sorry. You're going to be very happy. Litotes or litetos are used constantly in the New Testament. I saw it multiple times in the book of Acts. Let me give you an example. Acts chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. But some of the men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, no small dissension and debate, he's saying they had a huge blow up. It's an understatement. It's a litote or litotes, okay? And so when he says you're not going to be hurt by the second death, what he's really saying is, no, you're not going to be hurt. You're going to be richly rewarded. Richly rewarded. It was an understatement. You're not going to only not be hurt, babe. You are going to get huge amounts of rewards if you finish strong. Okay, church number three, the church at Pergamum. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Okay, there are three key points. Let's take them one by one. Number one, hidden manna. Hidden manna. Manna is food. And if it's hidden manna, it must be talking about a form of deeper fellowship. Deeper fellowship with God, deeper fellowship with Jesus. You're going to get some hidden manna if you finish strong. Okay, point two, you're going to get a white stone. A white stone back in the time of Jesus could also be used as a ticket. A ticket to get in to an event. It was a ticket to an event. Hmm, what could that ticket be to? Oh, I know. You get to go to the wedding banquet. You've been faithful. You finished strong. You get to go to the wedding banquet. You get a ticket. 
And this agrees with Revelation chapter 19, verse 9. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. They're invited. They got a ticket. They got to go in. Okay, there's a third thing. They'll have a new name written on a stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. A new name written on a stone. A new name? Hey, a new name. What does that mean? Oh, it might mean a nickname. And a nickname means deeper intimacy. And only you will know it. If you whisper something to someone, hey, let me tell you about this. Only you and that person know it. That means deep intimacy between you and that person. Yep. A nickname and deeper intimacy if you finish strong. It's conditional. It's not based on the blood of Jesus. It's based on whether or not you finish strong. Okay, let's go to church number four, Thyatira. Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 to 28. The one who conquers and who keeps my works unto the end, to him I will give authority over nations. And it says, eventually, I will give him the morning star. Again, two key points here. Number one, authority over nations. That means you have the right to rule and to reign. We've talked about that the whole time here. It's the right to rule and reign. What God wants for his bride to sit with him on the throne. And then secondly, they get the bright morning star. What is the bright morning star? Well, in Revelation 22, verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. So by saying, I'm going to give you the morning star, again, now we're getting specific. We're going to have deeper intimacy with Jesus himself. Deeper intimacy with Christ. If you finish strong, you'll have deeper intimacy with Christ. Church number five, the church at Sardis. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Okay, three key points here in this church for those who finish strong. Point number one, White garments, white garments. Oh, they get wedding clothes. They get to be a part of the bride. Why? Because they finish strong. Second point, he says, I will never blot his name out of the book of life. His name out of the book of life? Hmm, that sounds like you can lose your salvation. But if you believe in eternal security and once saved, always saved, which I do, it can't mean that. So what does it mean? Well, the Greek word for name is also used in verse 1, but there it's translated as reputation. I know your reputation in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And so this could easily be translated, I will never blot out his reputation out of the book of life. Reputation or your nickname. Did you know that Jesus gave nicknames here on the earth? John chapter 1, verse 41. He found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. We brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Men and women, Jesus gave nicknames. And he's got a nickname for you and a nickname for me if we finish strong. That's the new name written on the stone. And if we finish strong that name will not be raised out of the book of life. Remember, we get a white stone with a new name written on it, a new name or a new nickname written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. He's talking about deeper intimacy there. So I was teaching this to some young 16-year-old homeschoolers in my town of Mechanicsville, Virginia, and one young man said a, a phrase that stuck with me, and I just said, that is brilliant. That is brilliant. He said these words. He said, oh, Mr. Shogun, you mean our name is written in ink in the book of life, but our nickname is written in pencil and it can be erased? I said, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Once saved, always saved. Our names are written in ink in the book of life, but our reputation is written in pencil depending upon how we choose to live our lives here on this earth.
And then he says, I will confess his name before my father and his angels. I will confess his name before my father and his angels. What's he confessing? What's he saying? He's saying this. This one is worthy to be a part of my bride. Men and women, if you finish strong, you get to be a part of the bride. This one is worthy to go to the wedding banquet. This one is worthy to be a part of my bride. Special rewards for those who finish strong. Two more churches. Church number six, the Church of Philadelphia. Revelation chapter three, verse 12. To the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. A pillar in the temple of my God. What is a pillar? Well, in Galatians, we found out that when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, Paul was writing this, and he's talking about leaders. They were leaders. They seemed to be leaders. He was <laughs> using sarcasm there. Uh, and so what he's saying, leaders, if pillars is leaders, what he's saying is, I will make him a leader in the temple of my God. In other words, you're going to have closer access to God. You'll be in his temple. You'll be a leader if you finish strong. It's conditional. Church number seven, the church at Laodicea. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. We've looked at this verse over and over again. Here it is. Sit with me on my throne. Men and women, think through this with your brain, with your heart, with your mind. If you're sitting with Christ on the throne, eight hours a day, eight hour day, maybe a six hour day, six, eight hours, but if you're sitting with him on the throne, high-fying him, doing all these things to him, looking over your creation, that just speaks of deeper intimacy. Deeper intimacy. You're going to be closer to Christ, have a deeper intimacy with Christ if you finish strong. If you're a Nike Christian, if you're an overcomer, if you're a conqueror, there are special rewards for those who finish strong. Well, we've gone through the seven churches, so let's review. Simple. There are special rewards for those who finish strong. The blood of Christ gets you out of hell and into heaven, but it gives you zero rewards. Those you earn through good works. And there are special rewards for those who finish strong. We went through the seven churches and we found out some of these rewards. There's deeper intimacy with Christ. The right to rule and reign. Leadership in the temple. And you get to be a part of the bride. Men and women. If you want deeper intimacy with Christ. You want to finish strong, there are special rewards. Well, I hope that was helpful. In our last talk in this book, we're going to ask the question that I get asked quite a bit, and we're going to answer it directly. Are we being selfish, wanting rewards? Thank you for watching Maturing the Bride. Hi, I hope you have been enjoying Grace Versus Works. As a friendly reminder, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Our desire is to get this message out to as many people as possible, which means other nations and in other languages. If you'd love to help us out with that, we would really appreciate it. In fact, if you're fluent in another language, and you want to translate these into that language, contact me. Let me know. I'd love to work with you on it. Or if you simply want to help us out financially, because we're already doing it in a few other nations in Africa, that would be a blessing as well. You can do that by going to www.givetoug.com. Thanks so much.